Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by, by Tri-County Logging. Experienced in sustainable forestry practices, Tri-County Logging can help you manage your property by keeping your woods healthy and generate income. Serving southern and mid-Michigan for nearly 50 years, tricountylogging.com. Hey everyone, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny Silik, and we've got an exciting show in store for you this week. I'm out here on the Manistee River. We are in the middle of March, just getting into springtime fishing, and we are out here steelhead fishing. I'm on a boat with three different charter boat captains. We're out here for a day of fun. You won't want to miss the story from here on the river. And Jimmy has something else in store for us this week too. Well, that's right, Jenny. We do have one more story on this week's show, and it's kind of an interesting topic. For the last 35 years, there's been an agreement between the state of Michigan and the tribes here in the state of Michigan about where they can fish, where they can't fish, and their method of take. And that consent decree has actually expired, and they're in the process of negotiating what that's going to look like going forward. So it could be very impactful for Michigan sportsmen kind of to learn more about this topic. We're going to sit down with one of the attorneys on this week's show and learn more about that whole process. So lots of good stuff on this week's show. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan out of doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, dancing on the pine forest floor. The autumn colors catch your eyes, here come the crystal winter skies. It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors. What a beautiful day in the woods. Someday our children all will see this is their finest legacy, the wonder and the love of Michigan as the wind comes whispering through the trees the sweet smell of nature's in the air from the great lakes to the quiet stream shining like a sportsman's dream it's a love of michigan we all share michigan out of doors is presented by by country smokehouse a sportsman's meat processor and michigan destination since 1988 offers a variety of homemade smoked meats and michigan made products in store and online the Country Smokehouse features an outdoor barbecue and bar. Details at CountrySmokehouse.com. By RBM Jigs, a Michigan-based company serving ice fishing anglers around the state and throughout the country. Specializing in ice fishing gear, RBM Jigs manufactures tungsten jigs, soft plastics, and much more. Online at LakeEffectLures.com. By Polar Craft Boats, offering riveted and welded boats for the outdoor enthusiast. Whether you're targeting fish or waterfowl, Polar Craft Boats have several models to choose from that keep you high and dry. For more information, PolarCraft.com. By Angler Quest Pontoons. Angler Quest is a Michigan based company building boats designed for comfort and fishing functionality. For more information, AnglerQuestPontoons.com. We're in the Big Manistee River, and we're kind of in the mid stretch of the river between here and Tippy Dam. Today, we're up a, towards the Pine Creek, they call it, water. And um, fish, you know, we're kind of mid, mid area, and fish are kind of staging to go up and spawn. Nice snowy morning. It's uh, pretty out today. Middle of March, got some snow, which is not unusual in Michigan. <laughs> yeah, so. Who do we have with us today? We got Jimmy Bennett. He's a charter captain for how many years, Jimmy? Well, then 55 when I quit. That's a couple years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and then Jason Decker, he's a, another charter captain. 20, 28 years. 28 years, yep. And yeah. I've been 38 years for me, so yeah. we've been, so, been around for a while. <laughs> we got 100 plus years of experience. Somebody's got to catch a fish. I today. hope so. Yeah, it's been a little rough, tough fishing, but we'll see what we can do. It's. Uh, it's steelhead it's fishing, you know, it's, it's all about the experience. Right now we're just we're float fishing bobbers, they call it, with jigs and using some spawn, occasionally wax worms with jigs, and um, run beads a lot of times. Beads work really good under floats. Every day is kind of different. One day they're hitting one thing, next day they won't touch it. And so you just got to keep changing until you find what they want that day. As the guys got set up, Jim and Paul talked about the beginnings of this fishery on the Manistee River and Lake Michigan. Well, I tell you, it was, uh, they were long and skinny and every one of them had a lamprey scar on them in the, in the early in 60s. Okay. The steelhead in the 60s, when did they yeah, first Yeah, they were coming the back, see, they, they started coming back and then they started planting the dickens out of them, see. Okay. And then it, it was really in the 70s when it, I had all that phenomenal fishing. I mean, it was 15 fish by 10 o'clock, you know, 
and you did, I didn't know what it, you know, we didn't know much either. <laughs> so <laughs> now it's it changed. Really, yeah. So that, the steelhead showed up in the 60s, they planted them in the 60s then? Or? Yeah, they started planting good. See, right after that was the lamprey thing, they started getting the lamprey under control. Okay. And uh, there was no lake trout left. They were, the all, gone. were all gone. There was no lake trout in the lake. And then they started, the fed, federal government started planting the dickens out of that with lake trout. Oh, and then the salmon, of course, were 69, right? The salmon, they planted the 69? No, 67. 67. Was the first adult run. They planted them in uh, 66, and they come back as jacks in 66. Okay. Oh, now he's taking a little line. There he goes. <clears throat> okay, come on, buddy. Turn around. The legend's got a fish on. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. They're calling no pressure. you a legend. He's a legend. That's what I call him. Only guy I know in the fishing foot hall of fame in Michigan. <laughs> it's the best part of it. It's watching somebody else catch a fish. Coming around this way. Uh, All right, coming around. Okay. That will get him here. <laughs> I almost could have got him. I could have almost had him, but I, I hate reaching for fish. <laughs> Let's see this. <laughs> Beautiful job. Nice nice red stripe down there. Oh wow. We got Beautiful it. job. Jim. All right, All nice right. going there, guys. Job, Getting buddy. me into the fish. <laughs> awesome. You going back in? Or oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right okay. Right here, we just put him right down in there, and there he goes. Awesome. Feels good, eh? Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Awesome. We're heading to a new, new spot. <laughs> Jimmy caught the only fish there? Yeah, only one. It had to be the only one. one. <laughs> I met Jimmy back in this probably early 80s when I first started guiding. And Jimmy was on the big lake then. He was still fishing the big water. It was at a, I think 2000 you quit, he quit, but I met Jimmy then and um, became really good friends. And I always was, he was like the guy I looked up to, you know, was a, a lot of cat people when they grow, kids grow up, they got somebody they want to mentor. And he was one of the guys that like, man, I want to be like him, you know? And it's, um, it was awesome meeting the guys like that, the old timers like Bud Rasky and Emil oh, Dean, yeah. knew all those guys that guided out of Manistee. And they were the ones that kind of started, started the salmon, you know, guiding salmon when it was started. And I call him the legend, but uh, yeah, he, in his day, man, he was the best. And, you know, he got into the fishing hall of fame and it was pretty cool. Pretty cool to know a guy, know a guy like that and did it as a guide and, you know, um, just, it was awesome. Well, is it better than you thought it was gonna be this morning or is it about how you've been doing? About how I've been doing. You know, it's been tough fishing, but we're getting, you know, some and we're a little ahead, ahead of normal. So hopefully we'll have a really good day today. Yeah. It should only be getting better as yeah, the days go here with the water warming up and stuff. So the fish should start, you know, coming in more numbers and stuff. Right. Not that a big guy, quick. but we'll take them. You want me to get in there, Paul? Yep, yep, get ready. Are you ready? Okay. Catch that fish, Paul. Don't let it down till I get the net in there. There you go. All right, oh yeah. Here, get right here. Good you got job. it? I know, it's 20 feet okay. long. I know I lost my net with somebody. somebody uh, we were trying to fish. Little girl. Come on, get a hold. Jason, get the pliers. Right. Oh, nice fish. Beautiful. Get that pliers there. Beautiful. Uh -huh. All right. Me and Jimmy. Yeah. All right, boy. Beautiful. Pretty little girl. Well, it's nature at its best. You got a fin fish. clip. The clip there. That's an adipose fin. Oh, nice. Pretty guy. Pretty yeah. little girl. Little yeah. girl. Yeah. Female's yeah. got the straight face, yeah. rounded head. 
Males got more of a hook jaw to them. Like the one Jimmy got was a male. Beautiful. Pretty girl. We're gonna let her go back and spawn and grow up. Yeah. Awesome job. Beautiful. <laughs> Having a good morning out here. Yeah. See, hey, I guess. <laughs> Jim Bennett was born and raised in the area and has been fishing his whole life. He guided on Lake Michigan and the Manistee River from 1967 to 2000. Then in 1985, he started guiding in the Florida Keys in the winter months. He guided there for 35 years and retired just two years ago at age 81. This is the first winter Jim has spent here in Michigan in 37 years, and he's loving every minute of it. In 1966, they put the first plant of coho in, and one, and one plant went in the, Man the Manistee River, or Bear Creek, and the other plant went up, uh, went up at uh, the bay up there, uh, Platte Bay, yeah. Okay. And uh, we we caught a lot of jack coho that first year in '66 in the river here, and uh, it was like un really unbelievable. And they were f three, four, five pounders already. They grew them that from April to that size and. So I, I says, uh, this is gonna, they're gonna be a big fishery here. So I decided to get my Coast Guard license. Jim got his guide license and got a loan to buy his first boat, a 26-foot Stamus from Florida. He quit his job at the paper mill in town and started chartering in 1967. He was one of only two guides here in Manistee that year. I can tell you, this is, uh, this is what really helped me. I met a DNR man by the name of Merle Keller, who was the head of fisheries for the Great Lakes, and they had the boat, the steelhead. It was brand new for the survey boat. And uh, Merle took me on the boat and showed me their graph system, the, the graph. And this graph, he, they were pointing out lake trout and salmon, and you could tell the difference in them. And I says, oh boy. So I went back, went to my banker, banker again and says, can I borrow $2,700? I want to buy a depth sounder. <laughs> <laughs> I did that, that, that really, I got to learn how to use it. And I really felt I could find a fish. And I knew, was, and, that, and, that, and that year, by the time the summer was over, everybody come out of the harbor called me. See, where are they at today? So. <laughs> <laughs> so you had one of the only pieces of technology. So I did, yes. Jim is very humble about it and seems to give lots of others credit for his amazing career. But his hard work and determination made him a stellar fishing guide. In 1996, he was inducted into the National Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame. He says his guiding career made enough money to keep the bills paid, raise his family, and put all of his kids through college. Now he's retired and just enjoys fishing with his buddies whenever he has a chance. And speaking of fishing, the guys were having a great day on the Big Manistee. Paul hooked another steelhead and it was on and off in the blink of an eye. It's always a heartbreaker to lose a fish like that, but at the next hole, Paul redeemed himself. Stop that rolling critter. Excuse me, Jim. You took him to your secret hole. <laughs> oh, yeah. So oh, that's oh, yeah. Look at that. That is so nice. How did that one play out for you? It was awesome. Nice yeah. little girl. And you said she's, it's a wild bred fish, yep. right? Yep. No she's fin clip, yeah. What a memorable morning on the Manistee. River guides and charter boat captains are a rare breed of driven, hardworking, and determined fishermen who live and breathe this stuff. To spend a day on the water with a few of the great ones and to hear the stories from Jim Bennett's incredible career is something to cherish for sure. Jim was a pioneer of sport fishing in Michigan and an important part of our fishing heritage. These are the days to remember here in Michigan's Out of Doors.
Okay, well, we are here today with Steve Schultz, who's with the Coalition for Michigan's Resources. Resources. And we're going to talk about uh, really a big subject, which is the tribal fishing versus sport fishing here in Michigan. I don't know if versus is the right word, but Steve, tell me a little bit about the coalition that you're a part of and, and then kind of walk me through the history all the way back to, you know, mid, mid 80s when the consent decree first started. Sure. Um, the coalition has been, is a group of oh, a dozen to 15 sport fishing and natural resource groups. It includes MUCC, the Michigan Steelheaders, the Michigan Charter Boat Association, and a bunch of local fishing organizations and clubs. And it's been involved in the issue over the extent and the scope of treaty fishing rights in Michigan since the early 1980s when it first got started. Um, and it's been pretty consistently involved ever since. There's been quiet times, such as the last 35 years, and there's been times when things have been really active and pretty controversial. And how does that affect uh, the Michigan sport fishing here in the state of Michigan? So walk me back to that first 1985, correct? Uh, was when that first consent decree, it, how did that come about? And give me a little history of that, how that whole thing kind of came together. Yeah, we, we like to say that if you were, you know, if you're 45 years old or younger, you probably have no idea what's really going on on the Great Lakes when it comes to the competition between treaty fishing and sport fishing and state licensed commercial fishing. Because in the late 70s, a federal court authorized the tribes, uh, found they had a treaty right, and authorized the tribes to fish in the Great Lakes in the treaty waters without any state regulation. And what that led to was, for a short period of time, unlimited tribal fishing. To give you an example, um, in 1979, in a span of about two months, according to DNR assessment fishings, fishing, 98% uh, of the lake trout were taken out of Grand Traverse Bay by wow. tribal gill nets. Huh. Um, it led to a lot of conflict. It led to uh, a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, and that led to negotiations that in 1985 uh, ended up in an agreement between the tribes and the state and the federal government. And that agreement designated areas where the tribes would fish commercially, designated areas where the state sport fishery would be predominant, and then there were some middle areas that kind of were a transition between the two. That's pretty much what we've had since 1985, so for the last 35 years. Okay, and so where is the area currently where the tribes can fish with, with uh, gill nets and that kind of? The tribes have, can commercially fish with gill nets or with trap nets, uh, basically from Leland north in Lake Michigan, and from Roger City north in Lake Huron, and from Munising east all the way to Whitefish Bay in Lake Superior. So a pretty good chunk of water. Pretty good chunk of water. And are they targeting a certain species? I guess with a, with a gill net, you're gonna, whatever swims in is, is there, but are they, is there certain species that they're after then, or? Yeah, the, the way the agreement was designed, going all the way back to 1985, is the tribes would commercially take whitefish and the state was allocated the salmon for the sport fishery. And lake trout were kind of in between. Some take by the tribes, some take by state licensed sport fishermen. And so this, this what, 30 some year agreement is now coming to, where are we at currently today with the, with the agreement? Sure. The 1985 agreement was amended in 2000 and a new agreement was adopted by the federal court, negotiated by the parties. That agreement expired last year in August. And the court, the federal court in Grand Rapids, extended that agreement through this coming June 30th to give the parties time to try and negotiate a new agreement. Okay, and so you're in the negotiating process now? We are. Okay, and where do, where do we stand? Is it something that is going well? Is that kind of, what are, as you represent the sport fishing here in Michigan, what are your concerns? What are we hoping to, to, to happen with the negotiations? Well, I think we think that the agreements over the last 35 years have worked pretty well. Okay. And the tribes have done very well commercially and the state sport fishery has been great up until recently when we've had some changes in the lake. Uh, but uh, negotiations right now are going slow. And it, I think it's due to the collapse of the whitefish fishery and the impact that the change in the lakes has had on salmon. Uh, we, we know the salmon fishery isn't what it was 10 years ago. And so 
if there is not an agreement put in place, or if you ca if you can't come up, to, what, what happens then? If there is if June end of June comes, what what, what could happen? Well, that's the great unknown. Um, if we don't get another agreement between the tribes and the state and the federal government, what you're left with is a whole bunch of uncertainty, and you've got five tribes and the state trying to regulate and manage the same resource that they share equally. And tr imagine trying to have six sets of biologists and six sets of law enforcement and the like trying to go out and regulate the same resource. It could be chaos. And it could open up the entire Great Lakes, correct? Well, what would happen at that point, uh, people need to understand the treaty waters include all of Lake Michigan south to Grand Haven, and they include uh, the Michigan waters of Lake Huron all the way south to Alpena and they include Lake Superior from Whitefish Bay all the way to Marquette. So there's a lot more water that conceivably could be opened to tribal commercial fishing. And so from your perspective, you know, talking to the Michigan sportsman that's watching the show, um, is this something they should be concerned about? Is it not that big of a deal? Just kind of, you know, how does this affect Joe Blow, Michigan sportsman? Well, the, the big thing could be a uh, gear conflict. It could be a, a reduction in the amount of fish available to be caught because if we don't have any kind of agreement, if we don't have any regulations in place, then we could have what we call a racehorse fishery, where tribal fishermen and state licensed fishermen go out and fish as hard as they can, as fast as they can to catch the fish before they're gone. And then when they're gone, there isn't a fishery left. And you get this cycle of a lot of fishing, a lot of fishing pressure, and then no fishing while the stocks rebuild themselves. And that presents a, a really bad situation for the resource and for the sport fishermen generally in the Great Lakes. One thing I would say, and, and I want to make this real clear, the, back in the 80s, uh, it was the bad old days. It was not good for the tribes, it was not good for state sport fishermen because we had conflict and we had a racehorse fishery and the resource was under a lot of pressure. Uh, everybody now recognizes that that tribal right is there and the tribes have a right to fish. And we've had a really good relationship with a number of the tribes and had, had good communication with them. We don't want to see that come to an end. Um, we want to see the fishery be managed from a, the point of biology. It's an equally shared resource. We need to all get on the same page. And I don't know if you can answer this or not, and feel free if you can't, but if, if the coalition was pretty happy with where we stood over the last 35 years, what are the tribes kind of asking for? What, what would they like to see changed in this, in this new consent going forward? Um, the, the problem is that uh, others in the tribal fishery say, we want to replace those fish that were gone and the only place they can look is our share of the resource. And that is making negotiations difficult because as I said before, everybody wants a piece of a declining resource and that's a challenge. So Steve, I know there's some commercial fishing that happens that it's not tribal here in the state of Michigan. Can you fill me in a little bit on how many, what does that look like here in the state? Sure, there are, there are roughly a dozen uh, state licensed commercial fishermen in Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior and the like, uh, who fish principally below the 45th parallel in Lake Michigan and, and south of Alpena in, uh, in Lake Huron. And then the tribal commercial fishermen essentially fish north of those lines. So, and let's just kind of project forward a little bit here just to kind of wrap things up. If things don't, if there is not an agreement reached, what is the next step then for the fishery? If we don't reach an agreement, there will probably be some kind of litigation in federal court, and the federal court will have to decide what the rules of the game are while that litigation goes forward. I don't think anybody wants that, but ultimately that's what will happen if we don't get an agreement. Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you stay tuned in upcoming weeks. We've got all sorts of springtime fun headed your way. We'll be doing some more open water fishing and we'll be looking towards turkey seasons. All sorts of fun headed your way. If you'd like to see where we are and where we're headed next, you can always check us out online. 
Well, that's right, Jenny. Online, always a great way to kind of keep tabs on us. You can do that through our website, our social media platforms, as well as YouTube. You can subscribe to our channel there. Get an email every time we post something new. Coming over the next several weeks, like Jenny said, we're going to be doing some spring fishing all around the state of Michigan. We're going to have part two kind of in our discussion about this consent decree, and we're going to sit down with a biologist on next week's show and learn more about really how the fishery has changed over the last 20 some years. Lots of good stuff happening, and it's hard to believe turkey season is right around the corner. We're going to have some turkey hunts to kind of get you excited for the upcoming turkey season as well. So get out there and enjoy this great old state, and hopefully we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by... Do you dream of somewhere bigger than your backyard? You can get there with Greenstone. Whether you want to hunt, fish, hike, or just watch the sunset, we're ready to help you own your place in the great outdoors. To learn more, visit GreenstoneFCS.com. By Green Mark Equipment. Green Mark Equipment is a John Deere dealership network in southwest Michigan and northern Indiana. Green Mark provides sales and services to farmers, commercial businesses, large property owners, and homeowners. Information about pricing and products available can be found online at greenmarkequipment.com. Closed captioning provided by Marvo Mineral, makers of Lucky Buck, deer management products including minerals to supplement deer diets year-round to improve health and antler growth. When I want to far away, a dream stays with me night and day. It's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow trout in a hidden stream. The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees. I am a Michigan man. I am, I am a Michigan man. Ask where I'm from and I'll show you my hand. Lord above, I love this land, I am a Michigan man. From the Keweenaw down to St. Joe, Kalamazoo, east to Monroe, to St. Marie and back again, I am a Michigan man. I am, I am a Michigan man, ask where I'm from and I'll show you my hands. Lord above, I love